You're listening to Get Informed America, the only true unfiltered show that's fighting fake news and finding common ground. Now, here's your hosts, Dave Oakenquist and Rodney Johnson. Hello and welcome to Get Informed America, the show that breaks through the mainstream media box to bring you real smart news. Hi, I'm Dave Oakenquist from Informed American. Joining me is the smartest person I know and the ever punctual, the always courteous, <laughs> the editor of Informed American, Mr. Rodney Johnson. Rodney, how are you today? I'm well, Dave. How are you? I am great. Always great to talk to you, Ronnie, to kind of go over the things that things that have stuck out to us throughout the week and that we think are important to bring to all of our readers and viewers. So with that, I'm going to run through the topics we have today. The Fed and Congress continue their relief efforts to try to pass legislation to provide relief for the economic impacts of the pandemic. We've got an update on a question I posed last week about the shortage of medical supplies and whether or not the United States should ban their exports. And then Dr. Fauci, he's always throwing numbers out there. And the latest number is that he's now estimating that about 60,000 deaths from the coronavirus, which is uh, something trending down. So some good news there. We'll, we'll dive into that. I've got uh, there's an interesting graphic that I found over the Internet called uh, or it shows the top 10 and, and bottom 10 uh, trends in consumer spending and e-commerce. So we'll see what people are buying while they're locked down in their homes. And then I have polling data. America gives their opinion. We'll run through that. And of course, the rapid fire segment called Stupid Things I Saw in the News. Rodney, let's dive into our first topic. It's not just Congress. It's also the Federal Reserve. It's working overtime. The Federal Reserve announced this week that they're providing $2.3 trillion in loans. These numbers just don't, they're no longer real. They're just figures. Uh, we got a little bit, a couple of highlights here. There, there's a Main Street, lend, or they're calling a Main Street lending program that's uh, to small and medium sized businesses for about $600 billion. There's a corporate credit program for $850 billion. There's a municipal relief fund for uh, states and local governments, about $500 billion. There's also something else called a Paycheck Protection Program Liquidity Facility, which <laughs> I love these words, uh, which will supp supply liquidity to participating financial institutions uh, to back uh, PPP loans to per, to pack. Uh, I'm sorry, this is just more small business relief. Meanwhile, uh, the Senate wanted to push through a $250 billion uh, relief package for small businesses, but that was blocked by Democrats who uh, wanted to add even more stuff onto the bill. So Rodney, we're throwing money at this problem, right? We're just dumping it on it. And the question is, what's going to work? How much can it work? And should Congress keep doing all this as well as the Fed? Well, Congress created the problem, right? We've, we've started this, I don't say Congress, the federal government started this whole thing of this reaction to the virus and the pandemic. And as we talked about last week and have before, and I know we'll talk about later on, yeah. you look at what we're doing and it's, this is economic suicide. And we're going to be asking good questions about whether or not this was worth it down the road. Mm -hmm. You see the Fed out there, most of what they're doing is backing stuff. They're not spending real dollars. What they're doing is telling banks who lend to people, lend to businesses, whatever, that we'll buy those loans from you later on. So the Fed doesn't actually put the money out there to an individual. You don't get a check from the Federal Reserve. Right. Um, but what they're trying to do is keep the plumbing going. But it can't, right? At some point... Uh, the person who has the restaurant, who leases the space from a landlord, who has a loan with a bank, somebody along the way is going to be missing money, someone. And so eventually that's going to fall. And the question is, well, who takes the pain? And, you know, you can look at it small and you look at it large. Uh, do you take the pain because you keep paying for the gym membership, even though the gym isn't open? Or do you say, well, I'm not going to pay, the gym can't pay, the gym's landlord can't pay, the landlord can't pay the building owner, the building owner can't pay the larger bank, and eventually it comes to, well, they just go get money from the federal government. By the way, that means we all pay. And so uh, we're, we're, we're rolling this up to the top level of the federal government, eventually the central bank, but it won't be enough. They're picking winners and losers. And so that's, that's going to be the fight down the road. And the best way to see this is their, their backing of cities and states. Mm -hmm. They say that they're going to offer relief, almost $150 billion, $200 billion to states and large cities and counties. That's, that's important. If your city or county has less than, I think, 500,000 people, you don't get anything. But guess what? You still have to uh, supply essential services. You have to supply <laughs> water. 
sewer, right. police, fire, health officials, all this stuff. And these cities are saying, we have no tax receipts. You're not allowing anybody to buy anything. And so it's going to be economic devastation. And we're going to have to look back at this and say, is that really what we intended to do? Or have we created a long, slow death for tens of millions of people, you know, in exchange for what we've gotten? Yeah, long-term consequences, absolutely. Quick question, Rodney, before we move on. Now, the Fed is at least, regardless of what you think of these numbers uh, and, and what it's planning to doing, is at least fulfilling that role of being a lender of last resort, right? Because I've seen reports that d- despite the legislation passed by Congress, that $2.2 trillion bill, that would ostensibly uh, make, you know, make loans for small businesses. A lot of banks are, are not, I was seeing reports that banks were not willing to write a lot of these loans for the, for the businesses in need, you know, maybe looking at, well, you know, the business isn't, isn't functioning now and there's no clear path for you paying me back. So at least maybe this would give uh, more, at least push that a little bit through to, so for businesses to get that relief that they need. If banks aren't willing fantasy. to do it. That's a fantasy. Because the, the lender of last resort is supposed to be, I as a bank have a loan out to a car dealership who's selling cars, but nobody wants to buy that loan from me. Even though the car dealership is still selling cars and paying on its loan, everybody's conserving cash for whatever reason. This goes back to the bank panic of 1908. Nobody wants to buy that loan from me. So me as a bank, I can't, re- you know, I can't replenish my own cash. That's where the Fed's supposed to step in and buy that loan that is functioning and in good standing. What we're talking about now is the Fed going out and funding many businesses that have no idea if they're going to exist three weeks from now or three months from now. You can't call that lender of last resort to good collateral, which is what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And so this is fictional collateral based on the hope that cash flow comes back. Now for many businesses it will, clearly many businesses it will, but many businesses it won't. And so we are going to be putting money out the door that will not be repaid, which is why private banks said we're not lending anymore because we don't know who's going to win and who's going to lose. And so the Federal Reserve came along and said, well, we'll just back them all. And what this became and is, is guaranteed profits for the banks. This is all about saving the banks. And so if, if you want to see who's going to be standing in six months, you know, no question asked. Goldman Sachs, City, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan. Those are the guys that are going to be around because the Fed wants them to. Yeah, we got, Rodney, we got to move on here. There's, we could dive further into this and even maybe should the Treasury even just step in and do this themselves, forget the banks. I'll, I'm going to let that hang and then move on. Let's see about that. Rodney, last week, the, I... Uh, I asked a question to you based on a, an, or, an article from Forbes uh, from, by David DeSalvo, who spent a day following the uh, mask purchasing uh, people who were trying to buy masks and uh, personal protective equipment and seeing a lot of, that, a lot of those orders. We well, were seeing one, uh, government agencies and state and local governments competing against one another and then, then further getting outbid by foreign buyers. And it was some crazy quote of uh, 280 million masks earmarked for exports. So, so I posed the question, should, should the United States temporarily ban exports of uh, personal protective equipment stuff like that for medical staff? And we both agree that they should. And then I think the president was watching last week because he issued a memorandum on, uh, just on Friday, which was the day of our show, that <laughs> federal agencies should use any authority necessary uh, to keep the highly sought after medical supplies in the United States and will seize any protective gear slated for export until it determines whether or not that gear is needed domestically. And, and, and the president, all, by the way, this story is also on Informed American, put up there by Rodney. And the president, I don't know if you noticed, on, it was either Friday or Saturday, was sparring with 3M getting into a, a war of words. What do you think about this move by the president? I'm assuming you support this. I do. And I just want to give him a shout out if he's watching the show. Like, <laughs> obviously. Uh, <laughs> but you, you know what? You, you take care of at home first, then you do your best to provide whatever aid you can to others, because yep. if you don't survive then you can't provide anything to anyone. And this just got worse because this, um, the CDC and others are now saying, Hey, everyone should wear a mask in public. Well, you just told, you know, 325 million Americans, but 240 million adults, when you go outside, you need a mask. Well, if you go outside once a day, that's 240 million masks a day. Yeah. If you're only going out, you know, once a week, you're still adding 240 million a week. So this is a big deal uh, because 
we're going to run out of masks very, very soon. Now, I know the difference between the N95 masks that block 95% of particulates versus the facial coverings where can just be cotton. And so right. it's not as if all the medical gear is going to be taken up by the private sector. Mm -hmm. What it means is there's going to be a huge move for people to do anything to cover their face. And so supplies are going to be short. Absolutely. And speaking of that, Rodney, um, I, we, we, we've had this discussion internally about masks and uh, I will be producing a how-to video to make a, a variety of different masks you can do home uh, at your own home using uh, just a, a few amount of materials at different levels of protection, even an N95 equivalent, Rodney, that you can, you can make yourself if you can't get a hold of wow. it. Wow. Final take. So there's a very interesting story in the paper today and I believe it, I can't remember which paper it was because I read too much of it. Um, but the Amish have jumped into the fray uh, for, I believe, the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and as you might expect, uh, the clinic gave the Amish a mask to use as a, a sample of, of how it should be made to match hospital specs. And it took very little time for the Amish to say, well, we don't have a lot of material. There's a better way to do this. And so they developed a more efficient use of material for the mask and have been producing them. And I think they're running about 10,000 a day now, which I find to be fabulous. Oh, excellent. Yeah, very industrious folks. So that is good on them. All right, yeah. Ron, let's move on to Dr. Fauci estimates that there will just be on just over 60,000 deaths. And this, is, this stretches out uh, to August 4th. This is a downgrade from the 100,000 that uh, was the recent projection and way below that 2.2 million uh, that he floated uh, at the end of last month. That was unofficial, but one that scared the bejesus out of everybody. On, uh, on informedamerica.com, Ronnie, you put up a story called COVID-19 hasn't significantly significantly increased U.S. or global deaths, numbers could be inflated. And there you, you note that nearly 2 million, or I'm sorry, nearly 3 million people die in the U.S. per year. And we're at just about 15,000 for COVID-19. And that's just a half a percent of the annual total. And even if we got to that 100,000 number, that would just be near 3% of the total. So Rodney, question for you is how do we put this in perspective? It's not half of a percent. It's half of a half of a percent. And so you're missing a decimal in there. I mean, 1,500 out of 3 million, you know? You gotta go to 300,000 to 10 and 30,000 for 1% and 3,000 for a tenth of a percent. So, I mean, you, you've, you've got, it's small. Let's go with small. Okay. And so this is something I've been saying since the beginning is, you know, I, let's look at the numbers here and pay attention. We don't want people dying in the streets. We certainly recognize the at-risk population is, should be very concerned about this, but we're talking about a very small number of deaths, and, and I am not impressed with how the CDC and uh, the other institutions have been handling this to go for those scary numbers and here going 60,000 at the top. It's like, are you kidding me? Look at this difference we're talking about. Um, but there, there's a couple of things to recognize in here. We don't, as we said, uh, I believe last week, we don't take the speed limit from 70 on the interstate down to 30 just because we know it's going to save X number of lives. But we do know that it would save X number of lives. Um, and so we have that one you know, efficiency to talk about here. The yeah. other side is uh, the CDC has instructed people who are certifying deaths in hospitals that if it's a patient that is positive for COVID-19, they have to list COVID-19 as the cause of death, even though it could have been something else. Yeah, heart attack or who knows, right? Right. And, and by the way, if COVID-19 is suspected, they have to mark it as COVID-19. Now, think about that for a minute. Somebody comes in exhibiting flu symptoms. They pass of a heart attack within hours of getting there. You haven't tested them for the flu or CDC or COVID-19. Maybe you put, you know, you, you got a sample, but you don't have the results back. You're going to mark this person as dying from COVID-19. When the flu has already killed 25, 30,000 people this year and expected to kill 30,000 more. And so I'm struggling because the numbers aren't clear and yet we're being beat on with this scare tactic. And here we are telling people to commit an economic suicide over it. And so it's concerning. It's, yes, it's, and we're gonna have to look back on this with a very clear eye and ask, is this what we really intended to do to ourselves? 
Uh, by the way, all great points, Rodney, but I, I do want to mention um, there was a story out of Germany that might give people a little bit of hope, which is how this thing is transmitted. They found that this really came from clusters of, of large gatherings, people at nightclubs, events. There was that Mardi Gras party in New Orleans, and it was more of this close contact for long periods of time that uh, was, was found to be the key of transmission, less so than touching surfaces, which I think the surface thing is what's been really freaking people out. Um, and it gives maybe a path forward for, for modifying how we socially distance. Maybe just keeping that you know we can go back to work we just keep a little bit of a barrier it's less about you know don't worry so much about touching the you know about the table and you got to disinfect everything and you got to disinfect your hands and all that sort of thing it's really about being in close proximity people sneezing coughing kissing doing whatever that's that's more the thing to avoid hopefully that that is the case what do you think of that before we move on i, I think it's right i mean from everything i've read what i'm hearing is this is actually a particularly weak flu the, the issue is that it's novel. We don't, our bodies haven't seen it yet. And so when we do contract it, we just, we don't have any immunity to it built up in the community. And so if one person gets it, you go to work and, you know, you're, you're standing in close quarters in a conference room for hours, you know, discussing some topic or whatever, then the other people who, you know, the virus comes in contact, they're likely to get it because they don't, several of them don't have immunity yet, which they do to influenza. And so, I have been reading how it is somewhat weak. And so this all makes sense to me and would explain, of course, the low numbers and everything else. <clears throat> yeah, certainly. Great. All right, Ronnie, let's move on. America gives us their opinion. I got some polling data I want to run through, get your take on. A Harris poll found that a majority of Americans support reparations from China, 54% <laughs> are blaming China. I think they should pay monetarily in some way for either the economic damage done or to the, the, the sick themselves. That's, uh, again, 54% of Americans, 41% of Democrats, interestingly. Uh, they, uh, Harris Poll also asked some other questions. They found that 77% believe China is responsible for the coronavirus spread. Now, this isn't surprising, but it's interesting the way it's essentially been cemented over time to me. Uh, and then uh, also 72% say China is not accurately reporting info on the pandemic. You know, that number should be 100 percent. But uh, it does show it does show a, a big there's a majority, you know, a large majority that believe they're responsible and, uh, and, uh, and a majority that says that they should pay in some way. What do you think of that? I'll ask you, do you think they should be, you know, writing a check in some way to underwrite perhaps, you know, medication or hospitalizations or something? What do you think, Dave? I don't think it should be direct payments. I think the I think the reparations that should be made is essentially uh, the way we economically isolate other countries, which is to continue the trend of moving production out of China. I think advanced economies around the world should basically be in unison as a way to punish China for this. I think I'm, I'm on the train with you. I, whatever punishment we could exact from them or payment we could extract from them would be a token. The painful, breathtaking amazing cost to China will be people getting their supply chain away from them the best they can yep. to, you know, just try and diversify over to Taiwan and to, which is going to be the best, by the way, I think Taiwan's going to come out of this looking pretty good mm -hmm. um, over into Thailand, and Vietnam, and Laos, and Cambodia. I think you're going to see some of it come back home, which is going to be good. And this whole one built road initiative thing is, boy, that's going to be a struggle. Because the emerging nations where China went and said, hey, we'll loan you $50 billion so that you can build a superhighway. Now those little countries are saying, hey, we can't pay back that $50 billion. And so they, they have an economic price they're going to pay no matter what we do. Yep, absolutely. And uh, just to tack on to that, uh, Japan, as part of their stimulus package, uh, allocated $2 billion to reshore production from China. So this is yeah. happening. It's going to keep happening. And uh, no one's happier than me. Uh, Ronnie, yeah, let's move so on. This, this is a bigger point. And I apologize because I know we're going to go over uh, what we wanted to do in time to no, go ahead. Uh, respect people's time. But go for it. This is, this is going to be a, a retrenchment of globalization. And globalization you know, it, it's two-sided coin. One side, you have very high efficiencies of manufacturing where you can send stuff to really cheap places to have it made. And all of us benefit because our cost of stuff is lower, right? And so we've been living with this now for 40 years, really since the 70s, you know, this all kind of got going. Um, and so it's been an economically great ride, not if you're one of the people that lost your job, right? But the other side of that is, um, it highlights the bottlenecks when the supply chain is broken for whatever reason. And so we've seen it a number of times. This is, of course, the biggest instance 
where when the supply chain gets broken, be it for confidence or for something real, everybody goes, wait a second, why are we supplying all of our stuff from over there? Yeah. And so you get this retrenchment back and people are going to build the redundancies, right? We're going to build some factories for things where we're really not the best at making it or at least the lowest cost. And so we're going to employ some people, but the cost of that good is going to be higher than it otherwise would have been. And the Germans are going to do the same thing. And the Indonesians are going to do the same thing. And so we're going to, everybody's going to pull back a little bit from that big push. And it's going to be interesting to see what we think of that as people. And it's the thing we've always asked, how much of your paycheck are you willing to trade to make sure that the supply is, you know, more steady or local or whatever you want to call it. And we're going to do that. Yeah, and that argument is, uh, and I do appreciate that exposition, Rodney. We the, the time is yours. We can be here as long as you want, especially when uh, when when, you're, when we're dealing in the when you're talking about such important stuff like that. And yeah, that cost, because you don't that, that the question in a sense is a little unfair in 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 a, in a sense because you're asking what do you want to pay now, but you're maybe not telling them what they're saving later, which is maybe when there's a global pandemic, you can ramp up quickly and, and not have these large gaps in the system. And how's that, how does that cost feel now? Would it have been worth paying an extra 5%? For- it never happens, right? Yeah. I mean, this pandemic didn't have to happen. I mean, if, no. it, if, the, if the virus hadn't transferred from an animal to a person in Wuhan, you know, back in whenever it happened, if it didn't happen or for many years, nothing happened. And so it's, it's the cost of that insurance. Yeah. What is that insurance worth? Think of it as, a, yeah, think of it as, as an insurance policy. I, I think that's a, that's a better way to, to, to frame it. Absolutely. A little bit of cost now to save you some pain later. All because we wanted some coat hangers to be five cents cheaper or something. Well, you wanted your electronics that you're using right I did, yes. this call to be cheaper and the clothes you're wearing to be cheaper and, you know, the goods hanging behind you on the wall to be cheaper. So. Oh, I handmade those. Um, uh-huh. those yeah. None of it came from China. <laughs> the paper, the prints, everything. Yeah. Uh, Rodney, the interesting thing, well, we got news this week that uh, Bernie Sanders has dropped out of the, rela- out of the race, uh, which ostensibly would clear the path for Joe Biden. But uh, the, the, the pers- there are persistent rumors about New York Governor Cuomo, and a Rasmussen poll found them both tied at 38% for the lead who they would prefer as the Democrat nominee. What do you make of these developments? And is, is it, I mean, is, is Cuomo going to sneak in here and take the nomination? Absolutely not. It's a, it's a fun thing to speculate on. Yeah. We're talking about, you know, what's going on with the delegates that Biden has won. Cuomo is not on any ballot anywhere in the nation, so he will not get um, delegates. It would require essentially a revolution at the Democratic National Convention to cast delegates del- for a delegate votes yeah. uh, for a write-in candidate. That will not happen, certainly not the numbers necessary. Um, it's probably more interesting to talk about what Bernie's done here, uh, which is not really drop out. He's suspended, staying on the ballot and speaking in Joe's ear. And there was news out this morning that uh, Joe Biden, of course, clarified two new positions yesterday, Medicare for people 60 yeah. to 65 and forgive student loans for middle and low income people. And so these are straight out of Bernie's playbook. Certainly. Yeah, I was just going to I was going to mention those two as well. So he's certainly moving to the left. I, I'm, I'm not with you there. I think the, the Democrat establishment knows that Joe Biden is brain dead and is looking for an escape hatch. So that's my, that's my. He has been their chosen candidate from the get go. And so he's the one that they believe can bring in moderates. And um, they don't know what would happen if you vetted Cuomo across the country. Does America really want another New Yorker in the race? Yeah, that's a good question. And I don't know that he's ever, yeah, has, well, how does he test and does he have, I mean, he's, despite being a governor of, you know, one of our biggest states, um, I don't know that people even know all that much about him or if he has some, some big negatives out there that hasn't, right. haven't been talked about yet. So very, exactly. very good point there. Uh, Ronnie, I want to quickly run through this, uh, these top 10 e-commerce, what's growing, what's fading. And it's some of the stuff I just want to I'm going to run through these. The number one, people are buying the most are disposable gloves. Makes sense. Number two, this one is the one that stands out to me is bread machines. I don't get this. Uh, three would be cough medicine. That makes sense. Soups. And then you get, you know, packaged, packaged foods, fruit cups, uh, barbells. People are buying weights because they can't go to the gym. That makes a lot of sense. And I wonder if they'll, maybe we'll be looking for a sale for barbells over maybe in, in six months, there's going to be a barbell. Garage sale. Garage sale. <laughs> 
Uh, people are buying milk and cream online, which I thought was bizarre. I don't get <laughs> that. And uh, dishwashing supplies. So what, do you, what stands out to you? Is it, is, it bread, is it bread machines for you as well? It is bread machines um, because <laughs> making bread is, is, you know, it's not a terribly hard process, but it's a bit of a long process. And it doesn't taste like what you get from the store. I happen to be a fan. My wife bread, made bread for years. I gained a little weight during those years. <laughs> um, and so I wish those years would come back, but I think the bread machine has long since hit the garage uh, sale bin. So not going to happen in my house. Isn't that the, it's a sad life of the bread machine, isn't it, Rodney? It, there's so much promise, so much, so many ideas, and, and ultimately is rejected and sent to the- It's just like the fruit dehydrator, which was around for years and was actually great. <laughs> the problem is we ate so much of it. And then, of course, the pasta making machine, which was never great and uh, only saw a couple of uses. Yeah. Don't be duped by the bread machine craze, people out there. You're yeah. going to regret it. <laughs> All right, Ron, let's move on uh, to stupid things I saw on the internet. Uh, two stories here, both from informedamerica.com that you all can check out. Pennsylvania shuts down state liquor stores so residents drive out of state causing chaos. This is just crazy. If there's one thing we all need is alcohol in this crisis, Rodney, and also uh, from informedamerica.com as well. Paddleboarder arrested for not social distancing while alone in the ocean. Let's, uh, let's, first of all, what do you think? What is the state liquor store nonsense? They shut it down and then you got to drive out of Pennsylvania if you want some beer or something that's nuts well it's the same old thing right when you find something that people are going to do and then you try to shut it down what happens is people then find a different way to do it that you didn't expect and causes yeah. other problems big surprise we have that issue right now uh i live near houston texas and so they're shutting down the parks because they think that people will gather in parks for easter and so of course what's going to happen is people are still going to gather they're just going to gather in different locations right. that can't be policed in any way and so you're going to have people in tight spaces that are all getting together that are doing exactly what you talked about earlier, which is spreading this virus because it's the tight contact that makes the <laughs> difference. And so it's really pretty silly how all this goes. Crazy, crazy. Uh, I've got uh, two, I got three items that I, I always like mocking the mainstream media. And I hope you all enjoy this too. So I've got three things, uh, three quotes from Twitter here. This one comes from, this is basically in response to uh, that Dr. Fauci press conference we were talking about, about this idea that now we may be under that 100,000 deaths, maybe looking at just over 60,000 deaths, which is a significant improvement. Uh, MSNBC host Christopher Hayes had a very different take on this. He says, uh, this is a tweet of his, the most cynical interpretation of, of all this, the one I can't quite bring myself to accept is that they rolled out the model showing 100,000 deaths after they knew it would be blessed, then so that they could go and anchor everyone to that number and take a victory lap when only tens of thousands have died. Is this, was this a cynical ploy to overestimate so Trump can claim victory while, while celebrating 60,000 deaths, Rodney? Is that the right read? That's silly, right? I mean, I, it, you take good news and spin it into bad news. That, what, a, what a life. Crazy. Well, that's the life of an MSNBC host, Rodney. Um, uh, a, and then we have a uh, quote unquote conservative blogger, Jennifer Rubin, who works for the Washington Post, uh, uh, retweet, re retweets a, a post story saying, if Biden is serious about winning, he needs to accuse Trump of willingness to kill people. Uh, should Biden, is it, would that be a good campaign strategy for Joe Biden, Rodney? I think that one might fall on its face. The only person who seems to be able to get away with that is Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> and that's because she's fairly safe in her district. So I don't think it's a good national campaign strategy. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> uh, last one here from Bloomberg Economics, a story here. Hold the outrage. Wet markets are a healthy alternative to supermarkets, referring to the Chinese uh, Chinese reopening their wet marks. And that's a good thing. Should... Uh, uh, we're looking for scorched bats, chopped up snakes, dogs in kennels, cats, um, pangolins, which is strange. Do you, do you think wet markets, are, are, we, is, are we showing anti-Chinese bias that we should really embrace the wet market here in the United States? Well, let's just go open up, you know, down the street here, right? Let, let's see what happens when, you know, you start selling wild and domesticated animals for food that are still alive to be butchered on site. I, it strikes me as uh, very difficult for that to be sanitary. So I'm not a fan. Well, that's farm fresh, Rodney. Maybe we'll yes, just... Yes, it is. It's Let's very... See. I don't know that it's farm fresh, but it's darn fresh. We'll go with that. <laughs> You know, even, even excluding these exotic and disgusting practices, even if it was just pork or chicken, I mean, it's out there 
with flies and stuff like that. I mean, you got to have it in a meat case, keeping it refrigerated. I mean, that's just number one, right? Well, you never really want to know how the sausage is made. No. Having, having been to meat processing plants and pork plants and certainly chicken houses, which are among the worst, um, there's some parts of the process that don't seem particularly clean, but it starts with how the animals are fed and cared for and tested for disease long before they're ever slaughtered which you don't get when you're bringing these wild animals in. So it's not like they're testing them. And so we don't have to look at the process at the point of, you know, slaughter and then, you know, butcher. We can look before that and say, this is a really bad idea. Absolutely. Ronnie, thank you so much for joining me, joining me this week. I hope you all enjoyed this show. I want you all to become an informed American by subscribing to this channel. Let's create a conversation. Let me know. Let us know what you thought about all these topics by commenting below. Tell us what you think. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love it if you hit the like button. If you're listening to us on a podcast platform, uh, we'd appreciate a rating and a review, particularly on iTunes. Also, do not forget, check out informedamerica.com for real smart news. Rodney, we're, gonna be to we're not going to be talking for a week, so what are you going to have your eye on uh, th in, the, in the coming days that we might hit on uh, for next week's show? I'm really watching uh, what happens in the markets. I'm watching the economy. Um, I think we're going to get uh, some interesting numbers and stories from people who say, look, I've applied for all of these bailout dollars, and I haven't received any. And so it's going to be interesting to see how quickly the money can flow and what can happen to businesses uh, when they start running out of cash. Uh, the Multifamily Housing Association, I can't remember the name, I think it's Council, reported that 31% of renters in apartments did not make a single penny payment towards their rent on April 1. 31%, and that number is certain to grow as we get closer to May. Yeah, that is a gigantic number, so we'll keep an eye on all of that. Again, thank you all for watching. For Rodney, I am Dave telling you to get informed, America. You've been listening to Get Informed, America, brought to you by the Informed American Radio Network. Please like and subscribe today in order to get new exclusive weekly episodes. Any questions, thoughts, or comments can be sent directly to info at informedamerican.com. And don't forget to visit informedamerican.com to keep up with real, smart news. Until next time, fight fake news and find common ground.